And it's so good to be here with everybody that has taken the time to watch us, uh, whatever the time you are right now. We are live on LinkedIn and also on Facebook and YouTube. So three channels that are uh, watching us live right now and afterwards, of course. My name is Paul Nunes Dia and I'm a co-author with Martin Duffy of uh, Beyond Virtual Meetings. Uh, a book project that we launched last year, Martin, right? That's right, Paul, yep. Since uh, early this year, we've been hosting these sessions uh, with renowned guest colleagues, facilitators, consultants uh, that help us to steer conversations here a little bit. And the subject for today is, Martin? It's to look at virtual and physical workspaces and, and how are we all going to manage blending both of those? Because that seems to be the direction that so much of people's thought and and energy is going in uh, for our, I suppose, newly emerging workplaces, because that, that's kind of how it feels to me, that we're in new territory. None of us have been there before. So we thought maybe a conversation about where might that go or what might it look like could be an interesting one for our, our, our guests and uh, our participants. Absolutely, absolutely, Martin. And I'm excited to have these dear guests with us here today and excited with the possibility that we can virtually advance the world economy. We can virtually establish ways of working that are really productive and also help to heal our planet from the huge damage that thousands and thousands of hours of travel by flight, by plane, have destroyed a little by little destroying our environment. And so the challenge is how can we become more, uh, even more productive than face-to-face -face virtually? Is that, that, would that be possible? I, I, I would like to uh, introduce briefly uh, Simon Wilson. Simon is, is, is a renowned facilitator and I learned a lot from Simon. Uh, I mean, I would say Simon, uh, this is not to embarrass you. It was, I could say like eight years ago, you, uh, Simon was already delivering uh, um, workshops on how to uh, facilitate uh, virtually online. And I learned a lot with Simon, lots of tricks. And so I, I can imagine that Simon has been really, really busy these last couple of years. <laughs> so that's his expertise as a, as, a, as a virtual or online facilitator. Judy Rees likes, prefers to use the term online facilitator because you're facilitating in a moment, whereas a, a virtual facilitator could be something else. We can also discuss that if you will. Tamara Berley, I love Tamara because she's totally not a, a, a digital person in the first place. So she's totally analog person. She has a, a, a company that has been awarded uh, several times by the IAF with, with uh, um, interesting word in strategic planning and with uh, large multinational companies. And she has lots of, uh, um, what do you say, serious games kits, but Tamara will explain that in a minute. So I'm so curious to know about how Tamara, are you uh, uh, making uh, uh, solving the hybrid bottleneck now with your work, <laughs> I'm sure. And finally, John, oh my God, John Oval is a pioneer. Remember John in 2018? When we, we uh, uh, John co-hosted with uh, David Curtin and my, my, myself, uh, Visual Collab 2018. So we were, uh, some of us in the Royal Society of Arts in London, a beautiful venue. And John was facilitating a, a virtual uh, group of participants that were also working hybridly. So we, we, we were not uh, uh, in our dreams uh, thinking about COVID imposing us this way of working. But it was really a success and for the first time in I, my life i realized that we could be equally engaged uh, in in a, in a remote environment as in a physical space it was uh, for me a, a discovery in 2018. martin is uh i mean my co-author and the twin soul is really uh i mean i i'm, I'm delighted to have found this partnership with uh, martin to co-host this uh, session to your meeting daughters and uh, Martin, from your expertise, but perhaps you would like to um, uh, uh, ask some questions to these gent to these colleagues. And uh, first of all, John, Simon, and Tamara, could you would you be uh, uh, sharing something with the audience that you never sh uh, shared before? In this show? <laughs> and let's start alphabetically with John. Oh, sure. Uh, okay. Well, thank you, Paul, Martin, Tamara, Simon. Uh, something I've never shared before. Wow. Okay. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I, I probably have shared this in some groups, but I guess not in this group. Um, uh, one of the things I, I love to do is uh, work with bonsai trees. And I noticed some of the characters behind Simon. So I'm, I'm sort of feeling that connection to, uh, to, to caring for bonsai trees. And maybe there is some relationship to virtual and hybrid and blended events, whether it's, you know, growing trees and caring for trees or growing and caring for humans. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Cool. That's me quickly, I guess. So am I next? I'm not sure if we're doing, um, if we're doing, okay, we're doing first names, not last names. That's <laughs> great. Um, so yeah, yours, yours, you made that beautiful connection. But so the thing I was thinking of, I've almost never shared this, certainly not professionally very much, which is a long time ago when I was about 20, I was arrested for playing music in the Paris Metro. I was busking. <laughs> I, I have to say I was never charged. So I was only arrested. And, um, it was a kind of interesting experience because I was sort of dragged away from this scene of music to um, a scene of a police station and interrogated and all that stuff. <laughs> and, and I then think, well, what is the connection? Because you made a beautiful connection, John. And I, I think it's just we find ways to communicate, you know, whether it's speech, whether it's singing, whether it's music, whether it's painting, wherever the location, we find ways to communicate. Sometimes it's appreciated, sometimes it's not, but we find ways to communicate. <laughs> well, I guess I'm up. Um, so the only reason I've not really shared this with anyone is because it's very recent. And that is that we're now entering the fourth wave of this pandemic in Canada. So I'm uh, preparing myself to um, stay entertained and engaged. Uh, and I've started doing some pottery. And part of the reason for that is because I desperately need something kinesthetic. All my work has been virtual. And I, uh, just to link that back to this conversation, it's exhausting and I need, I need other things. Um, so yeah, I've started doing that and it's uh, thoroughly enjoyable. I fully encourage anyone who needs a, a brain break to start doing something uh, creative. Yeah. John, I might, um, I, I can't quite trump you with being arrested, but I can trump you, not trump you, but I can empathize with you that I was moved on from a busking spot in, ah. a, in a, a night busking spot in the Niederdorf in Zurich uh, mm -hmm. many, many, many years ago. Not the most salubrious part of town I discovered afterwards, <laughs> but, uh, but we were moved on for making too much noise past 10 o'clock curfew. Um, so, so perhaps we might uh, share some more stories on that at another day, John, or Simon, sorry. That's amazing. And uh, so uh, what brings us here today? Hybrid work. What, what, a, what a pain. <laughs> yeah, what, what to make of hybrid work. I, I suppose um, in just some of our, our own thinking, and, and I'm biased here because I suppose one of my passionate interests is just organizational meetings. That's that's what I did some of my research on and so on. Um, and I, I find it really hard to think of an organization doing anything without meetings. Two or more people coming together to get something done. That's, you know, that's my definition of a meeting. In that context, guys, but looking a bit more broadly than just organizational meetings, um, where are you seeing or where are we seeing the, the possible big bear traps for moving into this hybrid space of getting back into the office while at the same time people actually some people wanting to stay at home and work online because they've rediscovered you know the kinesthetics of their back garden or or they've rediscovered the music that they used to enjoy previously or or they've taken up new hobbies such as bonsai or something else um how, how are we going to manage the conflicts or potential conflicts that are coming in that? Open to the floor, guys. Don't be shy. <laughs> I, I love this silence. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, um, I think it's very uneven. And it's, uh, it's uneven across the globe how this is all kind of playing out. And it will be continuously evolving. So I'm not sure that there is sort of an answer that's gonna take us into the future. I think there are many um, options uh, for 
different situations depending on what your situation is right now. So yeah. uh, it's it's not easy. I, I'm I'm watching um, leaders in my client groups struggling to figure out how to navigate this. I think it is very um, uncharted territory. And I think it's not enough to just say, well, we have <clears throat> virtual options and we have hybrid options and we have options to be in the office. And um, it's just a matter of coordination and technology. I think there's, um, there's a lot more going on and I think that it's going to also continuously change. So even if an organization decides that their policy is going to be, you know, be in the office two to three days a week and will bring in anyone else who's not here virtually. Uh, and then that's just, it's going to be fine. In a couple of weeks, that could change again. So I actually am thinking that one of the skills is, is really about agility uh, and understanding what all the different options are and then being really flexible uh, around that. Yeah. I guess I reflect on what what are the big drivers in an organization and what I'm picking up is very different responses depending on those so um, I work a lot with an environmental organization big organization strong net zero carbon commitment for them um, virtual has been a, an opportunity to reduce carbon and so they are very, very slowly thinking about possibly a little bit of face to face. But actually, I have a feeling that they're going to land in a space which is largely virtual. I then work quite a lot with universities and, you know, particularly the traditional universities. They want the students back. They want people back. They want that face to face connection. So there's there's a really strong pullback. And so in the same country, in the same sort of environment, you've got quite different responses depending on the drivers. The ones that I think are the most interesting, of course, always are, are the smaller network, collaborative, not-for-profits, who are the, the ones with no money and lots of innovation. And I think there I'm beginning to see some of some really new configurations of hybrid um, working, which I think might be some of the pointers for the future. Absolutely. I'm enjoying this already. And uh, I guess what I would say is I, I sort of notice in this moment uh, myself leaning forward in the chair. I notice uh, an interest. I, I'm, I'm really listening to each one of you speak and listening for the words and the sounds and even what's not being said. Um, and I guess I start with that because um, Catherine Woods has this quote that has stuck with me for a long time. Um, uh, Martin, it goes to your comment about meetings. Um, Catherine says, are we in a meeting or are we being met? And I really, I like that question, like that. right? Are we in a meeting or are we being met? And I, I hope I'm offering to like meet that. me, yeah, to be met. Um, so that one jumps out. I do appreciate the, the agility. I also appreciate um, uh, conversation. I, uh, I guess I hope that's what we... So already is happening right now in this moment is let's let's engage in a, a back and forth, um, see what emerges. Yeah. And what I reflect on here is that, you know, we, we dive to meetings. Um, and yet the one thing that I think virtual facilitation has taught me above all else is that it's about the synchronous and the asynchronous. It's about what happens at the, with people together at the same time and what happens differently. And so virtual and hybrid working is not just going to be about meetings it's going to be about alternatives to meetings um and yet what is it that we are seeking to do i i, I wanted to add a couple of words to your definition martin about you sure. know yeah. meetings you know getting people together get things done and build connections and create relationships and make friendships you know because it's that it's that social dimension of meetings as okay. well. So, how do we find so, the social dimension virtually, asynchronously, and hybrid? How do we do that? And there is some very interesting thinking on this. I mean, Pilar Ortiz's work, I think, is great. Virtual, not distant, in this area. Mm. So, I think we need to be thinking not just meetings. It's about mm. the whole package of working together in these different contexts. 
I read an article in, in the Irish media here just about two weeks ago where they were making the point that where, where senior management may simply come out to all their staff and say, we're going to go hybrid or we're going to go exclusively virtual or we're going to partially come back to the or whatever. So they'll state the policy and that the big burden is going to fall on the middle managers to actually deal with the fallout. But, but I actually thought about it a little bit more myself and thought, do you know, is, is this an opportunity for the bottom to actually speak very loudly and very clearly about what the bottom wants to inform what the top decides? Is, is, is this a key opportunity to almost flip how organizations think and how organizations grow to whatever it is they're going to grow into? Well, I think if that's the case, then they have, uh, then organizations would have two choices. They can either um, just decide top down and uh, not engage uh, the employees throughout to sort of find a good solutions, um, in which case they're going to end up facing um, a whole bunch of new reactions, I think, and I think we've. This is this is what's sort of coming out now. Is you know they're talking about uh, the great resignation. You know, people are quitting their jobs. I, I mean, I'm not yeah. sure to what extent this is happening. I'm not sure where everybody's going <laughs> when mm -hmm. their jobs. Where's where are these other magical jobs <laughs> that everybody's going to? But there are people who are. Um, are burning out uh, or who uh, just really don't want to work in the ways that they're being asked to. And, and I think there needs to be some recognition that part of the reason for that isn't just, oh, I'm enjoying working from home and, um, you know, I, I don't want to commute. I also think people are really concerned about their health. And yeah. if that was not the factor, then they would probably be, uh, many people would probably be fine uh, to go to the office. And it doesn't mean they're not committed to their careers either. So the organizations can have a top-down approach and people are just simply going to react um, no matter what and the organizations will have to deal with it. Or they can engage uh, their employee base and um, from from the outset and say, okay, if we really are all in this together, then let's figure out um, uh, what, a, what a path forward might look like in this moment. It reminds me, Martin, of... Um... Uh, Barry Oshry and Karen Oshry have been running a workshop. In fact, this year or last year, it celebrated 40 years. It's uh, it's got a very generic name. It's called the the OW, the Organization Workshop. That's how simple the name is. Um, and what happens is you you walk into a workshop and you don't you think you're going to be uh, talked at, but in fact there are zero PowerPoint slides. Um, it's an immersive, experiential workshop. Um, and just to pause there, Simon, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about workshops versus meetings versus conversations versus relationships. I'm loving that, that part of this too. But, but in that particular workshop, you, for seven 10 minute days, um, you are a top, a middle, a bottom, or a customer. So you, you have, you're not role playing, you have set up a, an organization, a temporary organization for that the length of that workshop, half a day, full day, sometimes as long as two days. Um, and so one of the, there's several major takeaways, but one of them is um, if your organization is going to employ a hierarchical design where a top, middle, bottom customer exists, because it's not the only design, and maybe part of the shift to hybrid could also unlock many more organizational structures but if we talk about top middle bottom customer those 40 years of research and workshops have found that the role the the deliverable the purpose of a top is to shape the organization and if you're not spending time shaping um, then you're not fulfilling the need of that hierarchical role the purpose of the middle is to integrate the organization and if you're a middle and you're not integrating you're not as productive as you could be. The purpose or the, what do they call it, a uh, unique value proposition of a bottom, which I think is a little bit of an unfortunate term, but so be it, um, a producer. If you're not producing as an individual contributor, as a bottom, um, 
then it's the, the hierarchy is not as productive as it could be. And then I love that the customer is part of the workshop. Um, the customer's unique value proposition is to validate the system. Is the top, middle, bottom producing? Because that is your check and balance, is the customer validating the hierarchy itself. So I guess all that to say is, yeah, does it, does it need to be a hierarchy anymore? What other options for organizational structures are out there? Well, Simon? That's, that's, that's amazing. And, and, and thank you so much, dear viewers. We are having lots of people liking us in, on LinkedIn Live. But please also uh, share your comments to these conversations as we like to make it as much as inclusive as possible from, with our viewers. Um, taking the advantage of this break on the flow of the conversation, I would like to bring here uh, my summer readings. And I've read this book, uh, this interesting book. Let me see if I can make a little bit of a publicity here also in order to um, see where I have uh, this. Uh, it's, uh, the title of the book is Do Nothing. I'm not sure if you're already familiar with this book from uh, Celeste Edley, uh, Do Nothing. Let me see if I can share it here with you. Yeah, Do Nothing. Uh, this is an amazing book on how to break away from overworking, overdoing, and other living. And it's interesting because what COVID has probably uh, uh, um, uh, made visible is that the way we used to work was uh, absolutely non-sustainable. You know, having this uh, uh, the kind of back-to-back -back meetings. Uh, in, in our agendas, you know, and, 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 and what uh, Celeste Adley says is that there is absolutely no need for uh, a human species to work. We have a number of basic needs as a species, like, of course, we need to eat, we need to breathe, sexually reproduce. But uh, it seems that the reason why people uh, are addicted also to going to work in the office is, is because uh, it fulfills the need of belongingness. Mm -hmm that we humans require this need of belongingness. And that's my, my problem uh, and the challenge for you, dear, dear guests and experts here, is uh, could it be that um, hybrid work it in the end will not be that successful because by going back to the office, we are fulfilling a basic human need, which is not work, but social belonging. I, I'm not... Uh, yeah. I, so I, I'm a very like in-person kind of person. And so I, I, I love um, the in-person energy and workshops. And so for me personally, I, I, I do really miss that. And I think a lot of people do, but I'm, I'm not sure that um, going back to the office is a prerequisite to um, the building a sense of belonging. Uh, I think it's it could be one um, one vehicle for doing that, but I think there's a lot of other other ways to do that too. And I'll just share a story from my nephew, who's 18, and he just finished his last year of high school here in Canada, uh, primarily virtually. So he was almost exclusively online. And I was chatting with him, and I said, you know. How are you doing? You know, do you miss your friends? Has this been really hard socially? And he said, honestly, this has been an amazing year. I've never felt so connected to my friends. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, he's been who, smoking. <laughs> who are you? And then he started telling me about this community that he's built online. Uh, that is separate from school, right? It's through all these other channels and platforms that that he's he knows about and i don't know about because i'm a lot older than him and he's got something like uh you know 200 friends who are actually always communicating and always engaging he's ma he's made really good friends for like 10 years or something he's had friends on or oh, maybe not 10 years i guess he's only 18 but you know for quite for many years he's had some friends down in the states who he's never met but he feels very connected to them and a real sense of belonging and part of this community 
And he's been a key leader in building that. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, well, I just let everybody have space and I let everybody share what they want to share. And we make sure we engage. We make sure we create a welcoming environment. And if people are jerks, we kick them out. And I'm like, okay, so that's how, that's how it's done. Then, you know, even virtually, I think you can, you can create a sense of belonging, but it, it does take some, some effort and, you know, the values that are behind it are important and uh, the so leadership. Is, is, is that potentially one of the positive spin outs from the stay at home uh, scenarios that so many of us faced that, that have we partially rediscovered local community? Have we discovered neighbors that we haven't seen in a long time? <laughs> have, we, have we been out on local walks where we've discovered nature, where we've discovered people who share that? And, and maybe that's part of the drive for people not to want to physically go back to the office as much as they previously did, because they realize what they've been missing. But the challenge for everybody is it's finding that balance, isn't it? It's, it's getting that balance between home and virtual between office and home, is that is that a fair observation? The, the real challenge, though, is that everyone's balance is different. Yeah. And so, in an yeah. organisation, how do you find the, find the balance between the balances? So, yeah. so tomorrow, probably. I mean, I'm not a techie person at all, but yeah. to me, um, working virtually, connecting virtually, it is just working and connecting, and the quality of the relationships that you develop depend on the people not the technology not the context um it's very interesting though was it your nephew you were describing that that, that, that person yeah he's just invented facilitation by the way it's kind of interesting yeah. everything <laughs> you describe is, I is great. Yeah. um but, but i think the the difficulty is you know I'm, I've, I've met loads of people in the last year or two who have joined an organization started a new job virtually have never met their colleagues face to face they've done it all virtually and some of them love it and some of them hate it um you know the the stories that people have been telling of the pandemic are stories of, of joy and sorrow obviously but in particular there's stories of the joy of working virtually and the sorrow of not being able to connect personally and and i think the difficulty with for me about the whole hybrid conversation is that Objectively, of course, it's a really daft idea. You know, of course, it's not going to work. It's going to be the worst of both worlds. But if you include the human factor, it may be the best we're going to get because some people really want the face to face like Tamara. Other people, like myself, you know, I'm not saying I never want to be anybody face to face again in a work environment, but I wouldn't mind too much, provided I've got, you know, some friends to meet face to face occasionally. And yet, if we were in the same organization, how would we make that work? And that's where I, I loved Martin's point about if you can make it bottom up, you know, and respond to that, what's the messy, uncomfortable mix that's going to emerge and turn out to be fruitful and creative? And what's the messy, uncomfortable mix that's going to emerge and turn out not to work? And, and I think we're, quite, we're, we're not even close at the moment to working that out. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. I think building on that context, one of the things I've learned just recently about virtual and hybrid is... Um, uh, the awareness of my privilege here in this physical house, the townhouse that I'm in, um, at the end of a, of a call like this, I will walk upstairs and today um, my wife will be upstairs and we could have a coffee, we could sit and chat, there will be another human up there. Um, there's usually our two children, at, but just last week they started in-person schooling this school year. So all last year they would have been upstairs. Now, I was somewhat conscious and aware of of you know being in a, a conversation like this and then stepping away and starting another conversation what i think i was admittedly less aware of i don't know what each of the four of you are walking into as soon as we hang up this call you very well could be by yourself yeah. and so now what happens simon to your point the balance of the balances what happens to those people that don't have another person there or or do have another person there and it's in a, a challenging relationship at yeah. the moment right so when you're in the workplace it is a very different context in the liminal space when you're between meetings when you're between yeah. conversations it's somewhat of a shared context i think in the hybrid and the virtual uh, it, it can be quite a different experience between conversations. 
and John, this is a real and because um, I, I, I completely agree with what you say. And also um, think about the different experiences of the workplace. Yeah. You know, we yeah. may have in our minds a comfortable office, um, but, you know, think about people whose work experience is, you know, is uncomfortable, yeah. is isolated, is overcrowded. And think about the people who have to travel to work and leave relatives behind who need caring and so on. So, you know, it's, it's just really building on this. The balance of the balance is the, the range of different human experiences which we're encountering. And, you know, how do we pluck from that an understanding of what, you know, a new work-life balance might be? I think it's a really interesting challenge. But isn't even, even articulating that, isn't that in itself really valuable to, to highlight that point that there's a there's a really new component to the future workplace that realistically has never been considered or thought about before um and and just focusing on that now it may feel a little bit un insurmountable because what strikes me about that observation john is that it's the multiplicity of it that if we have a hundred people working in a place previously we had one context or environment within which we tried to accommodate those liminal spaces that you referred to. Now, for 100 employees, we've got 100 contexts that have to be in some way considered. They may be made explicit, they may not. Um, that poses a big challenge from a, from a management perspective, from an organization development perspective, and then from a sustainability perspective that keeping whatever you build, keeping it going week on week, month on month, year on year, to account for all of the hundred variations that those hundred workers are going to have. Whoa. Just pinpointing that is, is a bit of a challenge, Tamara. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to pull back to something Simon said earlier, which is um, that just around rethinking how the work is done uh, and this is certainly something as a facilitator that um, I've been addressing since we've gone 100% virtual over the last uh, year and a bit. And um, I've been, you know, saying to my clients, we can't <clears throat> just because you want a day long strategic retreat. I really don't advise us doing it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, let's break this up into bite sized pieces because people are get really exhausted by engaging um, exclusively virtually. So it's also about rethinking how you do things. So how you hold a meeting, like why even why even be on the computer when you're holding a meeting? Because it's not really, uh, you know, the, what a meeting is, somebody said earlier that, you know, a couple of people or a bunch of people coming together to get some work done or have some conversations. There's lots of different ways in which we can do that. Uh, I know a lot of people who are doing more walk and talks now, right? Yeah. So moving your body and talking on the phone. Remember that thing, that phone <laughs> thing that we used to have? And, yeah. and there's a lot of asynchronous things that we can be doing that kind of break up. And if we think about some of this as um, like questions around access and also questions around energy, right? How we spend our energy or, or the way in which certain types of um, um, meetings or ways of working take up our energy. And if we think about, well, how could we do that in a more positive, energetic way, then it starts to change, not just sort of how we organize ourselves organizationally, but it also changes how we organize and conduct our work. And I think there's still a lot of room for creativity in this area, um, you know, different ways in which we can um, hold a virtual meeting, for example. So, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, I'm really big on kind of the kinesthetic. And I, I do think that people get really exhausted when they've been sitting on the computer all day long, staring at each other. There really is Zoom fatigue, you know, it's a real deal. So there are things that you can do um, in those kinds of sessions that help to um, uh, kind of stir up energy. And I don't mean the jumping around and dancing kind of thing. I mean, just, you know, having things that you can touch and use kinesthetically and using the space that people are in, um, in order to um, kind of change, change those up as well. 
What, what occurs to me is that it's an obvious observation, but the the small organisations I know, the small businesses, the small charities, the small um, networks, they're doing a lot better on this because you know you're not dealing with the same numbers of people, but also I think more flexible systems, more responsive systems. Yeah. So you know I, I I work quite a lot with partners who are you know network consultancy businesses of a dozen people. And, and they're just making it work, you know, in, in very flexible ways. I think it's when you take it to scale that I think there is there's this real risk and opportunity. So the risk is that what we've been, you know, collectively as a human species fighting for 100 years, which is the factory system, Taylorism, you know, the, you know, the big block systems, that that reasserts itself. You know, that's the risk. Without any thought, it reasserts itself because that's what it does in the system. And then the opportunity is the opposite of it, which, you know, this has, as Paul was suggesting and Martin was suggesting, provided a break point where actually organisations can look afresh, including those big organisations that you might have thought were too large to change. And I might jump in there too. I'm, I'm loving this. Um... Paul, you mentioned how in 2018 we ran a hybrid event, and you can imagine it had been a you know quite a few years before that that we'd been practicing and, and building those things. And I remember uh, when I first entered the workplace, um, my head, my heart, my gut all said uh, synchronous, asynchronous, in person, virtual is all possible. It all can work well. You just have to think about it and plan for it. And I, I, I believed that it would be productive and impactful. And then I remember working with instructional systems designers who quite vehemently said, absolutely not. You choose <laughs> your virtual or your in-person. There is no blending. It doesn't work. We've researched it. We've tried for years. And where I'm headed with this, it's a bit of a, for me, it's been a roller coaster. Uh, yes, it works. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. And I've gone back and forth. And so what I might offer in this moment is two things. One, um, it's been helpful for me to notice my own reaction to what's going on in the moment. Almost, uh, am I happy with where things are headed? Am I unhappy? What I'm trying to, so that's kind of point one, just noticing what's going on for me as things change. But maybe what I'm really trying to say is noticing my relationship to what's going on. It's that happy, unhappy, uh, irritated, agitated, comfortable, uncomfortable. And the more I've been able to catch myself and notice those moments of, ooh, I don't want this to be hybrid. I do want this to be, I want this in person. That, um, that catch really seems to help me, I don't know, uh, engage in whatever it is that's going on. Yeah, oh, I think that's that, amazing. Uh, for, for me, that's kind of reflecting it back into the, the individualized nature of the environments, the new environments that, that we're all going to have to, to wrestle with and deal with. That, you know, where, Simon, go back to your point about Taylorism, you know, where, where if, if we put them all into a highly structured, highly regimented, highly regulated context, we can get the maximum productivity uh, as a concept. And, and, and we turn around and, and it literally throw of a switch, everybody is dispersed. And, and now we have to find our balance. And, and that's that roller coaster. Uh, idea, John, for, for me, typifies, I think, where everybody has been. But being on a roller coaster isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, I, I look at the roller coaster and say, yeah, well, you can have some pretty good time on, on a roller coaster. <laughs> but it's it's a question of it, who who's paying attention to the lessons to be learned, who's engaging with it, and, and then what are the mechanisms that we might be able to use. And here's the here's the supreme irony, that to deal with answering the question that we've posed, we kind of have no choice but to engage in a virtual way in the first instance. So shock horror, the mechanism that we're debating about in person or virtual, we have to use the virtual to get back to the in person. And, and you'd be kind of hopeful that we don't go back to where we previously were. But how we get to where we're going, it seems to me, it's the bottom up is going to tell us a lot more than the top down. 
Uh, and, and that's a bit of a roller coaster that personally I'm really looking forward to. But dear friends, are we discovering a new dimension on being human with this, uh, the fact that we are now, we are forced to work online? Is, is this bringing uh, new dimensions of being human and being connected that we were simply unaware in the past? My, my quick joke, Paul, just to try and insert some humor is I hope everybody has seen on the Maslow's hierarchy, um, as you were talking about belonging, and I think self-actualization is the top, and psychotherapists and therapists for years have kind of debated and talked about it. But the, the humor I've seen recently, and maybe you've seen it, is people have redrawn that chart, and beneath the physical safety, they've written uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> as the primary human need. And then they've gone further. Underneath Wi-Fi, they've written battery. <laughs> so you have to have battery and then Wi-Fi and then physical safety. And I don't even know if that's an appropriate joke, but I find but, it funny. So there you know, go. But John, I think that there's there's actually some real truth in that, which I and I was sort of mentioned something about access earlier. And I think that that's also part of this story yeah. is um, who actually, and you were also talking about privilege, right? Privilege. So who actually has access um, yes. to the technology that might be needed in order to participate in a more actively virtual kind of world. And it's, it's, if you look globally, of course, we can see there's huge disparity in access to technology or Wi-Fi or batteries or electricity um, or uh, the kinds of platforms and technology that are needed, which costs money. I mean, I, uh, you know, I was recently yeah. doing my my bookkeeping for my business and I'm like, wow, I spend a lot of money on virtual stuff these days like everything it's like zoom and you know all these other platforms and and but there's another level of access which is when as facilitators we're working with groups uh you're also dealing with um perhaps a diverse group of people even within an organization that have different comfort levels with technology yeah. and even though there's lots of like cool stuff out there you know, hey, you can be an avatar and you can move around a conference room and you can do this and you can do that and you can participate in a poll and you can, you know, there's all this stuff you can do. Do you need to do all of it um, or should you do all of it when access uh, can, be an, can be an issue? So if I'm dealing with um, someone in a group or I'm working with a group where I know there's somebody there that maybe is not super comfortable with all the latest and greatest technology, I need to figure out how to still hold that meeting virtually and make it as accessible and participatory as possible. So I think that that question of um, uh, access to Wi-Fi, but also just um, access to the technology, either because of costs or because of comfort and capacity, is is a is a really big part of this story. I love that you bring up the privilege. Thank you so much for doing that. And um, uh, with the privilege and uh, the inclusion, the belonging side of, are, are we in not only welcoming organizations, but, you know, welcoming communities, welcoming groups? Are, are we open to difference? Do we crave and seek, bring difference into the groups? And maybe that's what's, Paul, you're, you're potentially asking about. I just yeah. wanted to add one, one point about inclusion. And I, I always do this, which is the and, which is, um, people with mobility problems, people with caring responsibilities, uh, people who live in isolated rural communities, people with no transport. For them, the big barrier was face-to-face, -face, was getting to, getting to offices or factories or getting to meetings. Um, and for many people, the experience of engaging virtually, and I'm thinking here about, for instance, public consultations that I've facilitated, the experience of engaging virtually is more inclusive. And that's not to deny, you know, again, it's the balance of the balance. Who's more included at the moment? Who's less inclusive, included? I 100% agree with you, Tamara, about the gadgets and the gizmos and, you know, yeah. all of that. Most people, when they are engaging, they're doing it with one of these. They're doing it on a phone not a laptop, not something which is which can access very easily. So we need to keep our processes simple. But but I couldn't resist Paul's question about, you know, is this something new about what's to be human? And and just 
you know, whenever people talk about, you know, this is a sort of revolutionary change in how we experience the world, I, I think about the scene in Victor Hugo's book, um, Notre Dame of Paris, where um, they're talking about the invention of the printing press. And they're standing in this cathedral and all the communication is through stained glass windows. And he's pointing the printing press and saying, this will destroy that you know we used to communicate through pictures and now we communicate through words and that was entirely wrong you know the printing press didn't destroy pictures you know um online won't destroy human conversation it's just adding another dimension and you know we as humans will manage that perfectly well wow Glad that's, that we end in an optimistic note, Tom, because we're approaching our 50 minutes. Otherwise, people will stop seeing, watching us in a few minutes. Martin, uh, any conclusions so far? And perhaps we could take a, a takeaway from each of you. And thinking about, uh, I, I'm thinking about uh, the, the manager that is struggling with uh, having to deal with uh, lots of issues of having the team back in the office or having still have uh, some online meetings due to the the Delta coming up again. So what, what would be a piece of advice you could give to our viewers on this challenge of uh, hybrid uh, remote work? And then probably you, Martin, you for the conclusions. Sure, yeah. Let's um, start. Simon, Tamara, John. So I thought, I, I loved the conversation. Thank you so much, particularly the bits I disagreed with. I loved that because uh, that's <laughs> so good. Um, because we need to challenge ourselves. I thought that Martin's question was great. Who's paying attention? Who's noticing? And so the one piece of advice is notice. Notice what's going on. Notice what people are saying. Notice how they're reacting. And, and that's the starting point. Thanks. Thanks, Simon. Tamara. So this is just a, a very practical note, which is um, really think about how things are scheduled and how things are paced and timed. Um, Paul, you were talking about this sort of back-to-back -back meetings. I, it's all I've heard from people now is that like they're literally scheduled at, at the hour. Just slow that all down. Like that's, it, it, it's, it's burning people out. You gotta give space in between these kinds of things. You gotta give people time to breathe and um, you know, just put more breath into your schedule overall but also when you're also when you're thinking about scheduling and timing and you're let's say you have some people who are in an office and some people who are who are coming in virtually um, you also have to consider um, when they are all available and how long it's now somebody has to commute you can't just book meetings at 8 a.m anymore because someone's on the bus like these are very practical things but they also make a difference in the quality of um, how people are feeling and the quality of their engagement in their workplace um, thank you thank you so much tamara john sure uh yeah Let's see, Simon talked about noticing or just notice. Um, Tamara said schedules and time and breath and availability. Um, I noticed for me that I, I was leaning forward for the first half and now I've kind of sat back in my chair. So I think there's a, a relaxing into this conversation in this group. I don't know if Simon or Tamara had the questions beforehand. I don't think they did. I know I didn't. So just the emergence of uh, being together in relationship, engaging with each other. Um, let's, let's continue. Let's continue the, the conversation with the five of us and whoever's listening and wants to contribute as well. Thank continue. you. John, Martin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of really interesting takeaways that, that I'm extracting from, from all the contributions. Uh, the, the, the first thing that really struck me at the very beginning of the conversation was actually every company every location every town or city every country might have a very different way of going about this from a cultural perspective from an historic perspective from a size perspective so that's the first big takeaway that i don't think there's going to be a one size fits all at all with this one this is very much going to be driven per organization and per the individuals in individual organizations so that's the first kind of big thing that jumped out at me um, second thing was this idea of the possibility of that creating new emerging type organization structures. So the traditional concepts of organization and organization structure 
might just evolve much more quickly than would have previously happened because of, of that diversity. Um, a, a third thing is fostering belonging. I think, uh, Simon, I think it might have been a, a phrase that you used, but the, the idea that no matter what we do, virtual or face-to-face, -face, that fostering the concept of belonging through whatever we do is going to be the foundation for holding all of the people together. Because again, another point, and I think it was Tamara made the point, it's not about the technology, it's about the people. And, and whether you're using a megaphone or a loud hailer, whether you're using a traditional telephone or, or the, the highest spec Zoom gadgetry, doesn't really matter. It's about the people and it's about the connections between the people. How we manage those, that's almost by the way, if we focus on building those connections. Um, my final takeaway is the idea that small is flexible, big is challenging. And I think Simon, that goes back to a point that you made, that small seems to have been able to emerge flexibly out of this particular scenario. And big might become small to remain relevant, to remain flexible, which, which again, I think harbors a really potentially interesting workplace future and home-based workplace future, at least as, as I can envisage it or conceive it. There are just some of the, the takeaways. Thanks for a really, really interesting conversation, guys. Well, this is amazing conclusions. Martin, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, John, Tamara, Simon, for being here with us. And thank you so much, our viewers, for uh, watching us and also for your likes and, and loves uh, on LinkedIn. Please uh, keep engaging with all of us. Uh, we are all here uh, tagged on this, um, on this uh, broadcast. So Simon, Tamara, and John can keep the conversation. And uh, stay tuned. Me and Martin will be hosting in October uh, next event on the series. Right, Martin? We still have to figure That's the fun. subject, but uh, we'll manage that. So thank you so much for watching. And uh, have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks very much.